Hello everybody, and welcome back to the Celestial Perch. Today I have the second installment of the New Player Guide. First one is going over more of just the general creating a species, creating your empire, and early game details. Uh, this one will be going over more of the in-game UI, the outliner, and just how to get set up within the game and understand all the systems that the game presents you with, because there are quite a few. When you start, you will have this government screen here that will show you just kind of again once you, uh, what you started out with, so your ethics, your civics, your species. Just read this, it has some RP, uh, and, pre and press begin. Once you press begin, it will zoom you into your home system. That's fine, just, you know, explore around a bit. But the easiest way to go to the galaxy screen is to either press this button or press M. This will bring you back to the galaxy screen, which is important. It will allow us to just kind of see, see where we're starting out, see our home system, Beerus Prime. But before we get started, we're going to go over all of the UI. So we're going to start with government, work our way down this. Let me unlock it really fast. We're, we're going to work our way down this. And then we'll jump into the hotkeys down here. You can see the game starts you out, of course, with four hotkeys. Being your homeworld, your military, your science ship, and your construction ship. We'll go over those in a bit. The galaxy map versus the uh, system map. There are also several uh, sectors and just kind of... Uh, map modes that are down here. We'll go over those, of course. Search features, help, main menu. And then we'll go over the outliner. Outliner has a lot of stuff that we need to look at. And we'll work our way, once again, back across the top here, which display all of our resources from energy to minerals, all the way to our empire's population and our current naval capacity. So without further ado, let's get started with the government screen. To bring up the government screen, simply navigate to the top left, Click on our flag, and this will bring it up. It will display our leader, our empire name, as well as basic empire information here. I would like to focus on ruler traits, as well as agenda. Starting with our ruler traits, each leader will be given a random set of two ruler traits. These can be impacted by your governing ethics. Specific ethics are more likely to get specific ruler traits, but for now, we have Charismatic and Architectural Sense. Charismatic will give us benefits towards edicts, whereas Architectural Sense will give us benefits towards buildings and districts. These will more than likely be different when you start the game, but it is important to look over these as they give you a slight edge in specific areas and can be nice to focus on. In addition, Oligarchic, Dictatorial, and Imperial Empires will all have agendas. Agendas are preset and exist with that leader forever. So, for example, White Wing x will always have fleet expansion until he dies and is replaced with a new leader, which will have a different agenda. This is different from democracies, which instead have mandates. Mandates work in a different way, whereas you have to complete specific tasks, like maybe building four mining districts, and then you receive a lump sum of unity. I generally prefer agendas. They don't require you to do anything, and you get a specific benefit. Like here, our ship build cost is reduced, our ship upkeep is reduced, and our ship build speed is increased. So agendas can be rather powerful. The only other thing I would like to mention for the government screen would be the reform, demographics, and advisor. You can reform your government to change your, th your civics or your authority every 20 years, and it costs unity. We have to wait at least 20 years to, to complete this. Moving on, we also have demographics. This will show us our empire population, how many pops we have across how many worlds, and as this pie is developed, we will add in different pops. So it might eventually have maybe 25% of a different pop, 25% of the, uh, this pop, and then 50% will be a different pop, all represented within this nice pie graph. As well, we have pop effects. So these are effects that are applied to all pops in your empire. So if we have a happiness benefit, We'll see it here, as well as pop growth speed, lithoid pop growth speed, governing ethics attraction, and biological pop growth speed. So it's all broken down here and can be useful to see how many benefits we have across our empire. Lastly, if you're interested in changing your advisor from something you started out with to something else, simply click on the government screen, go to advisor, and select a new advisor. Depending on how many DLCs you have, you will have a different set of advisors. There's always original, 
but this is up to personal preference. For now, we can move on to contacts. Before we move on to contacts, I would like to mention that the navigation bar, which is over here to the left, can be locked in place. You might find yourself playing and continuously hitting this and accidentally bringing it up and clicking on something that you don't want to click on. Scrolling down to the bottom here, you can press lock, lock the navigation bar, and it will no longer pop up when you scroll to the left side of the screen. For now, I will leave it unlocked so that when we hover over it, we can see what each thing is named. To get to contacts, we can either just hover over the navigation bar, click on it, or we can press F1. Pressing F1 will bring up our contact screen. Here we can see where we've met other empires, fallen empires, primitives, or other, which could include like enclaves or caravaneers. Um, here we can also sort by the name, our relation, our diplomatic status, planets, relative power, the federations they're in, or their war status. This can be useful as sorting by stuff like relative power or federations can show us maybe which empires we stack up evenly with, which empires are ahead of us, as well as which empires are in a federation. And we can make diplomacy as well as espionage with them here. It will also give us a nice idea of their current relations. As this fills out, you will see more and more people within the contact screen. I'm going to put up on screen here uh, something what, what it might look like within the mid-game. Also, if you happen to vassalize somebody, this is where the agreements are, where you can see their vassal agreements, and you can change or adjust the vassal agreements here within the agreements tab. But for now, that is all we really have to go over with the contact screen. We can move on to the situation log. Now, moving on to the situation log, this will contain three separate tabs being the situation log itself, anomalies, and victory. The situation log will contain any special projects or event chains that occur, and they will be stored here. As we develop to the new player guide, I will bounce back to the situation log and show you how special projects are developed or what, what might be found within the situation log. As we explore with our science vessels, we will also find scientific anomalies. They will be placed here, and we can see the anomalies that we have where they're located, how long it will take, and generally what difficulty ranking they have. As well as just kind of like a brief overview of what the scientific anomaly is. Lastly, we have victory. The victory screen will show where we rank, our total score, and a score breakdown. This will change as the game continues and we, you know, join federations, absorb subject empires, capture relics, and our score will increase with it as well. At the bottom here, it will show on January 1st, 2500, an unidentified empire will win the game. As we currently have not met them, we do not know who will win, but checking this frequently, or at least maybe every 50 years, is a good idea to see where we stand and if we're advancing relative to the AI empires. But for now, we can move on to the market. Now to get to the market screen, simply go over to the navigation bar and select market, or we can also just press F3. This will bring up the internal market, which for now, we can trade energy for resources. We can trade for either minerals, food, consumer goods, and alloys. As we find and exploit strategic resources, they will be added here. And as we expand into the galactic market, we will also have access to any other resource that any empire has, as long as they are a part of the galactic market. You'll notice here that we have a market fee of 30%. As you can see here, each resource has a different base price which can be seen as we cycle through these. And the 30% is factored into the base price. So for example, if we were to sell 100 minerals, rather than getting 100 energy, we would only get 70 because of the base price and the market fee factoring in. Now, this also occurs on a large scale. If we were to sell 10,000 minerals, rather than getting 7,000 minerals back, we get 5,614. This is because... For each resource that is sold, it does not take into the bulk price. It actually takes in each individual mineral. So the first mineral sold will be at 0.7, but the 2,000th mineral might be at a different price, lowered because of the sale of minerals. A good way to get around this is to use the automatic trade system. By selecting this, we can choose to either buy or sell. Clicking sell, and then for example, clicking food, we can choose to sell food with a specific amount 
as well as a minimum sell price, giving us a total per month that we will receive. But for now, we will leave this blank and go through that later. As I mentioned before, we are currently using the internal market. But after the galactic community has been formed and the galactic market has been selected, the galactic market hub will also receive a market fee reduced by 10%. So from 30 to 20, if you have no other modifiers. And it will allow each member of the galactic community to participate in the galactic market, which means if they have a resource that you do not have, you will now have access to it, which can be quite nice. Lastly, there's also the slave market, which will allow us to purchase and sell slaves. The game will notify you if any of your base species are on the slave market. But the slave market can be a great way for authoritarian empires to take advantage of extra pops simply by using energy. Something that other empires will not have access to or will have cost extra. For us, as an authoritarian, it can be an effective way to grow our population. But for now, we can move on to planets and sectors. Moving on to planets and sectors, clicking this or by pressing F4 will bring it up. And here we can see our sectors. For now, the game will only have one, our core sector. This will represent where our empire capital is. And the sector screen will show us our output any general surplus or deficits we are running for each sector. Now, keep in mind, each sector has a sector capital. So, for example, Furus is our sector capital for the Furus Prime sector. This can extend out four hyperlanes. So, if I close this for a second, we can see here that Furus is here, and this planet, potentially habitable, is only one jump away. So it would fall under the Furious Prime sector. Now, if we had another colonized planet, let's say eight jumps away, it would be in a uncharted or unclaimed sector, which we would then have to create by giving it a governor and creating its own sector, which would then it would become the sector capital for whatever it is. It would extend four hyperlanes out as well and would be shown on this screen. The sector Screen is also a great way to either automate, where we can create sector settings and turn on automation. For now, it will be disabled, which means we will have to manually build and manage our sectors. But here we can also, in the mid to late game, put on a focus, which will turn on planet automation. And we will go over that in the mid game once we have a better idea of how to just do the general uh, side of Stellaris as automation is something we only want to focus on once we have a good understanding of how the game works. For now, the sector screen will just be a good idea to see which sectors are giving us what resources and what we might need to focus on a bit more or what could be lacking. But we can move on to the expansion planner. Moving on to the expansion planner, this will bring up all of the habitable planets that we can expand to. For now, the game will just show you if it's surveyed, I would also recommend that you check this is colonizable. If we can't actually colonize it, we don't really want to look at it within the expansion planner. But here we can sort by minimum habitability as well as our species, and it will display planets with different things. The class, we can sort by habitability, the name of the planet, any rare deposits, the size, the distance from our capital, as well as the amount of generator, mining, and agricultural districts, any modifiers, and the status of the planet. We will bring this up in video 3 once we actually begin expanding, as the expansion planner can actually be quite useful. For now, it will be empty, as we do not have any surveyed planets that are colonizable within our system, as we only own one, and the planet is already colonized. But for now we can move on to policies. The policy screen is actually rather useful. Pressing F6 will bring up our policy screen, which you will see here, quite a few policies. I'm not going to go over which specific policies to change or which specific policies might be meta, as if you watch this video in six months, a year, hey, maybe even in a couple of weeks, this could change. So for now, the only thing I would like to mention is just that 
it can be useful to go here and just kind of look through each individual policy, see what it does, see how it works, and see what effect it might have. For example, within our economic policy, the game is starting us out with a militarized economy, giving us reduced consumer goods but increased alloys. There's also the option to switch to a mixed economy, no bonuses or penalties to resource production, or a civilian economy with a benefit to instead consumer goods at a shortage of alloys. The current status would be to change to civilian as it would help us with our consumer goods and doing so will prevent you from changing this every 10 years. So once we change to civilian economy, keep in mind that you'll be stuck there for 10 years. The thing to keep in mind for our policies is once we reach the factions, which as you see here, are down here, factions will spawn and factions will prefer specific policies. So a pacifist faction might prefer only defensive wars, whereas a militarist faction would prefer restri unrestricted wars. So by changing your policies, you can improve your faction's approval. But for now, we can uncheck these and come back to these as they come up. Reading through all of these will give you a good idea of what policies you have available to you at the beginning of the game. I'm not going to go through every single one, just keep in mind that you can change these and they do have a large impact on your gameplay. But for now we can move to another important feature, which would be our edicts. Moving over to edicts, pressing F7, this will bring up any and all available edicts, as well as our edict fund. I'll briefly explain how that works. Available to us, we have an edict fund. As we can see here, we have a base of 10, increased by another 10 because of our ruler skill. So at the base start of the game, it will always be at least 20. But because our ruler was charismatic, which as I mentioned before, is on our government screen, underneath our ruler traits, we have additional edict fund. So we have 40 instead of 20. And as we can see here, we have two available edicts, each one costing 14. Read over each edict. Your edicts at the start of the game are based upon your ethics. So authoritarianism will give us information quarantine and fortify the border. Every empire will have fortify the, fortify the border available to them. Each edict will give you a specific benefit. For example, fortify the border will increase our starbase upgrade speed, which we'll go over later, and our starbase capacity. Information quarantine will increase our stability and our governing ethics attraction. This is something that's very powerful, as increasing our stability would pair quite nicely with our police state civic, which gives us already plus five, meaning simply just by being authoritarian, taking police state, and activating the information quarantine edict, we can have plus 10 stability. Depending on which ethics you choose, you will have different edicts available to you, as being a spiritualist would maybe give you a, a different edict compared to a materialist. Now, the actual edict fund is how many edicts we can run before we dip into our actual unity production. We'll get into unity production within the next screen here when we go into society management. But for now, we can run both of these as they cost only 28 total. And 28 out of 40 would not dip into our unity. If we only had 20 edict capacity, and these both still cost 14, we would have 28 out of 20, which would mean we would remove 8 unity production total from our empire. It's something to keep in mind that generally you do not want to go over your edict fund unless it is extremely beneficial to you, and I would say keep it within 5-10% to of your unity production. So don't remove more than 5-10% to of your total unity production, and you should still be able to go through your traditions relatively quickly. Speaking of, let's move on to our traditions. The traditions, or society management, are located here. Our unity production, which is up here, I will be going over all of the resources nearing the end of this video, but for now, we will have to go over unity, as unity is used to unlock new traditions, recruit leaders, and, as stated before, enact edicts. Uh, unity is kind of our cultural progress, our cohesion, and in general is produced by either bureaucrats, priests, or other jobs like rulers, 
which unify our government. Now, once we have enough unity, being here 300, as we produce 36 a month, it will take us nine months. We can unlock different traditions. Traditions are located here, and we'll, we will have several traditions to choose from. Completing a full tradition, which are kind of like mini tech trees, will give us ac access to ascension perks. I will have these on the screen here, just to kind of give you a good idea of what they look like. But as we continue through the new player guide, you will see them, and you will see, generally speaking, which traditions I pick, which you can obviously choose your own traditions, as the meta might change and evolve, and certain traditions that I choose now might not necessarily be as powerful as they are in the future. Also, within the traditions screen, we have relics and crisis. For now, relics will allow us to look at any relics we have, either from our precursor event, which we'll go over later, or archaeological sites can also give us relics. As you can see here, we also have minor artifacts, which will have different actions to take. Minor artifacts are recovered from archaeological sites and represent kind of like um, an additional resource that you can use. Depending on how many you have, you can either use them to sell, use them to celebrate specific things, or perform other actions as you progress through the game, as seen here. We will get additional ones, but for now we just have these base three. I wouldn't worry too much about minor artifacts or relics as we won't have those for quite a while. Now moving on to two systems that are connected quite a bit. We have ship designer and fleet manager. We're going to be starting with ship designer. This will show us all of our available ships as well as our defense platforms. For now I would say, suggest just using the auto generated designs for either corvettes, destroyers, cruisers, battleships, titans, it really doesn't matter. Um, it helps to just get a base idea of how fleets work and how fleet management works, as opposed to trying to min-max specific ships. Uh, after you've gotten maybe a few games under your belt, it can be better, it will be better eventually to design your own ships to either counter the AI or use kind of meta builds. But for now, if you want to build a Corvette, just use the auto best, as it will give you relatively okay Corvettes, in addition to defense platforms and other ships as we continue. As I play through the new player guide, I will also use just what the AI gives me. Now, moving on, we also have the Fleet Manager. The Fleet Manager, I have a separate video already up. I'm going to link that here as to not go too much in depth to the Fleet Manager but it will allow us to reinforce specific fleets as well as create new fleets with different designs so we could add corvettes and eventually other stuff like destroyers and cruisers. And here we can also micromanage as to how many ships we want within this. So if we want 20 corvettes within this specific fleet, we can increase it. And there are two buttons to keep in mind here being reinforce fleet and reinforce all. If we have multiple fleets and we press reinforce fleet, our shipyards will automatically build ships to reinforce the fleet as much as they can. Whereas if we have multiple fleets that are all weakened, we can press reinforce all and the shipyards will build ships to accommodate all of our fleets. For now, we will leave this as is and go into more detail later as needed. Now, moving on to the technology screen, we'll be met with three types of tech to look out for being physics, society, and engineering each with a leader associated. So, for example, we can choose any of these three. And also, while you're playing the game, you might have a point where a drop-down menu with new physics research will pop up, and this will simply take you straight to the screen, the text screen, where we can choose a specific research. Do this as soon as it comes up. So, for example, we have these three to choose from. Zero G, blue lasers, and global energy management. Each will fall under a different field. So this one will be field manipulation, this is the field of particles, and this is the field of computing. That can be factored in later, but for now, it's also important to look at the cost. So this is the cheapest one at 2000, middle of the pack at 2500, and the most expensive one at 3000. Now, we also want to factor in our leader because we have a base research speed for each one. 
Research speed of 29 for physics, 25 for society, and 26 for engineering. This will be affected by your population, as well as just any benefits you have. So for example, the base 29.94 is applied also by his skill, his spark of genius, and the fact that we are materialist. So each of those will input and give us a total of plus 17%, plus 7, and plus 12. So that 29 becomes 35, and then each month we will add 35, and let's say we select global energy management, it'll now take us 86 months to complete this tech. Same thing for this one, this one costs 2,000, completing it at a rate of 27 per month will take 74 months. And this one will cost 2,000 as well, and will take us 68 months with a bonus of 12%, so a total of 29. Last thing to factor in is each tech also has a specific path underneath here. For example, this one is the infrastructure path. So if you hover over, it will show you that this technology will lead to further advancements in civilian infrastructure. Whereas this path will lead us to further advancements in the field of robotics. Some of them are just kind of basic. Nanomechanics will just increase our engineering research and does not have a specific path. But for now, we will take the robotics path and if you ever want to change your research, you can press this button, which will allow us to reselect. So this will take us down the administrative path, which is nice. And this one does not take us down a path, but it's still very useful. It gives us an extra edict and an extra building. Last thing to keep in mind is that we can auto-enable uh, auto-research. So once we complete a tech, it will select a new one for us. I would not recommend using this even for a new player. This is more so for something in the late, late, late stages of the game where we have repeatable technologies coming into play. Then you can turn on uh, auto research for now, select each one, read them, see what they give us, see what they do, and choose ones that seem interesting to you. And as well, we can see which research we've, we have uh, previously researched for both physics, society, and engineering. You'll notice here that all of these are starting texts. As we add specific ones, they will populate here, and it will no longer say starting tech, but it will show us which techs we have, which will give us a good idea of what we have, and maybe we'll, what we could get in the future. Starting techs don't really matter too much, as they are the same for every single empire. But that is about everything we can go over right now with technology, and now we can move into factions. Now moving on to the factions. Uh, factions don't spawn at the start of the game. Uh, factions will only spawn for a regular empire after about 10 years and only after you've met at least one other empire each month a percent chance to spawn uh, spawn the first set of factions for an empire with the parliamentary system civic uh, factions can spawn after the first 30 days so much sooner for now we don't have any and won't have any until about year 10 but factions will normally look something like this as shown on the screen they're a representative of your uh, empire's ethics. So for us, they would generally represent authoritarian, xenophile, and materialist. Now, each faction has approval, a size, and support. Approval being directly correlated with uh, how much pop happiness we receive from each faction. The size being how many pops are actually a part of that faction. And support, political power, is held by the pops in that faction. Now, lastly, we also have issues Issues will pop up for each faction, and satisfying those issues will lend to higher approval. And like I said, the higher the approval of a faction, the more happiness you get out of those pops, up to 10% extra happiness if it's at 80 to 100%. And if you're 20% to 0%, you can have down to, I believe, 40% reduced pop happiness for those pops within that faction. So the general set of rules here is to try to satisfy the factions as much as possible and try to get as many of your pops into the factions that you have high approval ratings for. Um, there really isn't too much to go over with factions right now as we do not have any. Uh, within part three or four, once factions appear and we start working with them, we can delve a little bit deeper into factions. But next, let's look at claims. Moving on to the claims system. Uh, currently, we do not have anything to claim. Claims are very basic in the sense that pretending we have all of this territory here 
if another empire owned these territories up here. We could use influence, which is a resource we will go over later within this uh, part two. But we could use influence to make claim to that, that territory or that sector. And then once we go to war, we can use the claims as a method to actually gain the territory or the systems. Uh, claims are relatively basic. Um, multiple empires can have claims to the same system. It's just if we are at war or we have previously owned the system, there is a different claim weight. So if both empires are at war with the defending empire, whoever has the better claim will actually receive the system when the war is over. Um, there really isn't too much to claims, so we can jump on into species. Looking at the species screen here, we can see which species are within our empire and which species are within the galaxy that we've met. For now, it's the same as we've only met our species. Um, it will show you the species name, the type, how many pops are within that species, as well as their preference and any traits they have. In addition, it will show you their rights. This is a very important part of Stellaris that a lot of people glance over, kind of gloss over with their first playthrough. And it actually has quite an impact on the game. As we can see here, we have the rights for our uh, founding species, the Amari. And we can click on the species and change their rights. Similar to the policy screen, there are several drop-down menus that we can change their military service, their living standards, their citizenship. And we can also change if they're slaves, what type of purge they have, if, if we're purging them, can they colonize planets, can they move between planets? Are they allowed to grow? Um, as well as their living standards and their types of citizenship. In addition to just changing each individual species, we have default rights. And these default rights will affect what our citizens are once they join our empire. So if we take over other species, if we take over primitives, if people immigrate to our uh, empire, if we buy slaves off the slave market, what will the default rights of any of those species be? For now, it will set them all to this. Uh, we're going to change these later once we have some possible species coming in. But for now, we can leave it as just the default rights, what the game gives us. And for now, I'll recommend that for you as well. But lastly, we can move into leaders. Looking at leaders, as you can see here, we have all of our currently active leaders, as well as the ability to recruit new leaders starting with governors, scientists, admirals, and generals. Each leader will have a name, a skill level, an age, and an upkeep, as well as any kind of trait. Uh, each leader will have a unique trait. So for example, if we went to recruit a new admiral, well, that's kind of funny. All three of these admirals have adaptable. Um, that was a poor example. Almost the same thing. We have two eager generals and one resilient general. And for scientists, oh, here, nice. We've uh, one with expertise industry, expertise new worlds, and expertise propulsion. So each governor will have those unique traits, as well, as I said before, a skill level. Now, a skill level is based upon their experience. Leaders will gain experience just simply by doing their jobs. So governors by governing, scientists by being employed in the technology screen, or by being employed in science ships. Admirals by fighting in battles or suppressing piracy, and generals from invading planets. Now, as those uh, leaders gain experience, they will advance to new levels. Uh, they can currently reach a maximum level of 5, but the total maximum through other effects and bonuses is 10. Now, each skill will increase your skill level effect. So for each uh, leader, for example, for scientists, they will receive additional research speed, additional survey speed, and extra archaeological skill, whereas governors receive extra resources from jobs, reduced empire size from pops, and reduced crime on the planets they are on, and the sectors they control. That's about all we have to go over right now for leaders, just that each leader has kind of this age, skill, trait, a base cost to recruit them within Unity, as well as a Unity cost. So just keep that in mind that, as well, the age is something to keep uh, under control as <clears throat> we do have a mean age where leaders will start dying, uh, 80. So as soon as a leader reaches 80, they have a percent chance to die. 
and that will increase monthly as it says your death chance 0.0% monthly so generally speaking go for leaders that are younger a 37 year old will take longer to reach 80 than a 46 year old so you will have that leader for longer meaning their skill level has a longer chance to rank up and you will receive those skill benefits from the skill level effects for slightly longer which can be beneficial next we'll move in to the hotkeys Moving on to the hotkeys, I'm going to go over this very, very quickly. Uh, hotkeys in this game are pretty easy. You simply press the number to go to what is selected. So for example, the game will start you out with four. Pressing one, two, three, and four will bring you to all of your hotkeys. To deselect the hotkey, simply right click and, and press remove. To create a hotkey, select anything you would like to hotkey. So for example, a shipyard. Press control and then the number. So if we would want to put our construction ship back on a hotkey, let's say we want to make a number five, control, five, and it's now a hotkey. For now, I'm going to remove all of these and just place them later in the game once we continue playing. The last thing we'll go over before we talk about the outliner and all of the basic resources and advanced resources within Stellaris will be down here in the bottom right. This contains several different map modes. I would recommend just clicking these throughout the game while you're playing, as currently they won't change much. You know, unions map mode uh, will show all the political unions, such as subjects and federations. So for now, obviously it won't change anything. Sectors will highlight each sector. Hyperlanes we can turn on and off. Trade routes will show us our trade routes, etc. and so on, depending on, on which one we select. We can also turn on detail map modes. This will show us all of our currently accessed resources versus what we have yet to exploit. So for example, currently we have yet to exploit two energy, two minerals, and two engineering research in our capital or home system. We can also find this by holding down the alt key. If you don't want to select it and have it permanently there, you can just hold down alt to quickly see what you've exploited and what you have not yet. So for example, here we can see that we have uh, 15 already exploited energy and minerals, as well as four uh, physics research and 54 trade value. So those are all currently there. And what is left is if we deselect alt or remove the details map mode, we can see we have two energy, two minerals, and two engineering research left. We will we'll have to build stations to exploit that and get that in our actual research or uh, re resource tab here. But for now, that's what the details map mode does. The last two important features, aside from just like the different map modes, would be the search feature. So for example, once you've explored quite a bit, you might forget where a specific system is. You can press this and type in a specific system. So if it says, hey, pirates are in the Yaragana system, type in Yaragana, find the system, click it, and it'll take you straight to it. Also, there is the help button. Help will just simply bring up the Stellaris wiki. So if you're curious about, let's say, uh, specific holdings, you can click on holdings. It will take you to holdings tab and you can scroll through every single one. It's actually quite useful. The last few systems and UI I would like to go over would be the top resource bar up here. It will display all of our resources as well as our storage and monthly gain and the outliner. Uh, we're going to start with the resources up here, beginning with energy credits. You can see here it will show us our storage, how much we have currently and how much we can store maximum, our monthly gain, how much we produce, uh, what the production is broken down into, what is consumed, and kind of just a general idea of what energy credits are used for. So I'm not going to go over each one specifically as this video will already be kind of long, but I'll just go over a brief overview of kind of what each one does. So energy credits are effectively cash, gold, um, just whatever you want to use to buy other resources. Minerals can be used to build districts, buildings, and um, are generally just used to build the infrastructure of your economy. Food is really just used to grow pops and it's required to sustain them so you just need enough in the positive and you should be good consumer goods are used to keep pops happy um, so each job will have a food upkeep and a consumer goods upkeep as well as any other upkeep required for the specific job but each pop will at least need food and consumer goods 
alloys are used to build ships as well as maintain ships and uh, build star bases. Influence is used to expand and as well it can be used to expand. We simply need to just survey a system with one of our science ships, send a construction ship to build an outpost which will cost, cost influence as well as alloys. Unity is used to enact our edicts as mentioned before, get traditions, and purchase leaders as well as maintain their upkeep. Research, on the other hand, being physics, society, and engineering research, is used to research specific technologies. So as we can see here, we've already chosen three, and each one will give us a unique benefit. These can vary from buildings to edicts to new ships to percent modifiers and so on. Next, we have our strategic and unique resources. Volatile moats, exotic gases, rare crystals, and other resources like Zero, Dark Matter, Nanites, and Living Metal can all be used to either upgrade buildings, enact special edicts, or complete projects that would require uh, specific resources. Empire size is a representation of you know, our territorial expanse and our districts, our systems, our colonies, and our pops all combined into a total size. When it's below 100, we face no penalties, but when it's, once it's above 100, we increase the cost of technologies, traditions, edicts, and campaigns. Empire size isn't something that we can really mitigate actively. It's something that can only be mitigated through passive effects like completing traditions or having specific authorities like dictatorial, which will reduce the empire size from pops. Next, we also have envoys. These can be sent to either improve relations with other civs, harm relations with other civs. They can also build spy networks. And when you have first contact events, envoys can be sent to complete these and help you meet other civilizations. Empire population will just show us which species make up our total empire population. Starbase capacity will show us how many total starbases we can manage. So currently we have one. It's within our homeworld system in Firis, as you can see here. It is an actual starbase because it has modules. And we can support up to three, so we can build two more at the current point in time. And lastly, we have naval capacity. This will show us how many fleets or how many ships we can manage before we would increase our overall energy production. So for now, we have our three corvettes. And keep in mind that each ship type as well will have a different impact on your naval capacity. So corvettes will cost one, destroyers will cost two, cruisers will cost four, battleships will cost eight, and titans will cost 16. So each of them increasing and representing a larger burden on our overall naval capacity. Now, lastly, when you start your first game of Stellaris, it's more than likely that the outliner will be closed. I recommend going over here to where the game will show you your uh, current year and scroll down here and press the outliner. You can also just press O. It will bring up the outliner. This will show you all of your sectors, planets within the sectors, your current shipyards, military fleets, and civilian ships. If you'd like to see what is currently being shown within the outliner, you can click the options button in the top right, and it will show you exactly what's being shown here. So situations, planets, sectors, branch offices, holdings, and others. You can also rearrange these by pressing the arrows to move it up, putting it more towards the top, or move it down, putting it towards the bottom. Also, this will generally be unchecked, meaning that within your outliner, all the planets will simply just show the planet type being arid. If you click show colony designation icons, it will show each planet having a designation icon, meaning that our capital world, its designation being empire capital, will now show that within the outliner and it can make it easier to see which planet is specializing in what. Now that we've gone over the outliner, the last thing I would like to go over is the kind of calendar or year button up at the top here. It will show us what the current year is, what speed we're going, and if we have the ability to pause or play uh, by simply pressing spacebar. 
We can also speed up or slow down the pace of the game. And I would recommend starting at just the regular default speed, which is just normal. We can turn it down to slow or slowest or turn it up to fast and fastest. But for now, we will keep it at pause. And thank you for listening to part two. This has just gone over all of the UI in kind of a more basic and general sense as we progress through new player guide parts three, four, and five, and more stuff pops up in a more detailed manner. We can dive deeper into each system. But for now, before you start each game of Stellaris, or your first game of Stellaris, it's definitely better to have a general idea of what each thing is used for, and just what each system kind of does. But thank you for watching, and tune in next time for part three.